Happy May Day, Sretan Prvi Maj, and Happy Internationals, International Workers' Day. Uh, I hope you are well, I hope you are healthy, I hope you are safe. Uh, this uh, Today's episode of the My Virus Mythologies is dedicated uh, to, I would say, the ultimate uh, virus mythology. Uh, namely, you know, you probably heard about it already or heard it somewhere. Uh, this phrase that uh, the virus doesn't discriminate. Uh, you know, when, when the, when the COVID-19 uh, from China reached Iran, in Iran there was a minister uh, who said that uh, it's a democratic virus uh, because uh, it doesn't choose between the politicians and be between the working class. It doesn't choose between uh, the rich and between the poor. Uh, and I think this is one of, of, of the biggest mythologies of our contemporary moment. Uh, uh, namely, this is completely untrue. Uh, there is a bloody class war happening all across the world. And this is something we have to remind ourselves precisely on the day of the international workers uh, uh, holiday. I mean, it's called holiday, uh, but uh, I would prefer to call it a day of struggle. Uh, this mythology that the virus doesn't discriminate, uh, you can see it, uh, uh, you know, you can see it bluntly in today's world. Uh, uh, you can see that uh, the first victims of, of COVID-19 and those who are most, who, those who are under the biggest risk uh, are who? It is the working class. It is the medical uh, uh, workers, the health workers, the doctors uh, who are on the so-called front line. It is the front line workers, uh, the millions and millions of workers uh, in the retail industry uh, from Amazon to the supermarkets, uh, delivery, uh, online buying, door-to-door -door delivery and so on. Uh, these are the people uh, uh, who, who are on the front line. Uh, of course, the virus as such, as a sub-microscopic particle uh, doesn't discriminate, you know, the virus doesn't care, but it is the current capitalist system which discriminates. Uh, so besides uh, uh, the, 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 the health workers, besides uh, the millions of workers in the retail industry, uh, there is also a vast uh, informal sector, you know, those people uh, who are not formally employed. Uh, and of course, uh, there is the global poor, uh, the hundreds of millions of people uh, who are currently struggling uh, day by day to survive uh, living in favelas, uh, living in parts of the world uh, which would be happy uh, to be able even to imagine uh, something such as self-isolation or so social distancing. Uh, so obviously something is wrong uh, with our system uh, and uh, today we will explore what exactly is wrong. Uh, we will explore uh, um, 
what's happening today, actually, which is uh, a big strike uh, uh, all over the United States. Uh, we will uh, explore the role of big Silicon Valley companies. Uh, and of course, we will come to, to Karl Marx, uh, uh, mainly his uh, uh, thesis on the something what he called the general intellect. Uh, but before we start, let's just start with some uh, uh, necessary figures, uh, uh, which will show uh, that the world towards which we are heading uh, uh, is a very dangerous world. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, many people uh, warn that what we might be approaching is uh, a, a sort of depression similar to the depression of 1929, uh, but I actually think it will be much, much worse. Uh, just look at the, at, at, at the, current, uh, uh, at the current figures. Uh, the current figures uh, say the following. So uh, uh, already 30 million, 30 million people uh, in the US, uh, in the United States, filled for unemployment. Uh, uh, the United Nations uh, um, uh, recently uh, said that uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, around 200 million people will lose their jobs. Of course, this already sounds big, uh, but don't forget that there is a massive informal sector uh, which accounts for 61% uh, of the global workforce, uh, which is around 2 billion people in the world, uh, which are all also 2 billion, which are also affected uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. According to Oxfam, uh, more than 265 million people uh, could be starving until the end of the year, and what's happening at the same time is that the rich are getting richer. Uh, uh, if there is one example of this uh, and that there is a class struggle uh, going on and uh, it never stopped, it uh, actually just accelerated. And if there is one example of this, uh, then it is Amazon. Uh, Amazon emerged as one of the biggest winners of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it's, uh, it has revenues of $75 billion uh, only in the first three months of, of the COVID crisis. Uh, uh, this, means, uh, over, this means that Amazon is earning over $33 million an hour. So once this will be finished, uh, imagine that uh, Jeff Bezos and actually the company just puts uh, uh, $33 million dollars in their pocket in one hour so probably now at this moment uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, were already earned um, and it is of course due to global capitalism it is uh, not so much due to the genius of silicon valley venture capitalists it is due to 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 to, to an internal characteristic of capitalism which is um, the expansion the commodification, the consumerism, and of course, uh, the exploit exploitation on which this vast wealth, you know, uh, is, 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 is based, is grounded. Uh, from the beginning of the COVID crisis, Amazon, uh, uh, the, the, Am the sales on Amazon had a boom of 26%, uh, higher than the last year. Uh, at the same time, and here we come to the class struggle, an important term today, uh, which is unfortunately not so often used by the left, but billionaires such as Warren Buffett uh, don't shy away of using the class struggle. He is even the one who, who is remembered for saying that there is a class war going on, but it is my class, not mine, uh, but the rich one, uh, uh, who is winning the class war. So it is them, the billionaires, who admit that there is a class war going on, and if we could have seen it anywhere, uh, at the same time, when Amazon this year uh, had revenues of $75 billion, uh, uh, the working conditions in the warehouses of Amazon were awful. Uh, uh, I think Engels, who was uh, writing about the, the, the working conditions in Manchester, uh, uh, would perhaps also be surprised that in the 21st century, the working conditions didn't, uh, 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 didn't develop further. So when the virus was entering the warehouses, uh, the workers didn't have uh, protective uh, uh, equipment, they didn't have masks, they didn't have hand sanitizers, hand gloves, and so on. Um, if you're interested in this topic, you can 
go to the YouTube channel of DM25 and watch uh, a brilliant podcast with uh, Chris uh, Smalls and Mehran Khalili, uh, who today talked uh, about a big strike that is happening in the United States. It's unprecedented, uh, maybe not because of the numbers, but it's unprecedented, although the numbers are rising day by day, but it's unprecedented because you have for the first time a coalition of the working class uh, between the different big companies in the United States from, uh, 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 from Amazon, Walmart, FedEx, uh, Whole Foods and so on. So there is a coalition, uh, uh, a strike, which is uh, calling for workers to walk out of the working place and basically a sort of a general strike. Uh, to see uh, what is wrong with today's uh, global capitalism and precisely uh, with Silicon Valley companies, and don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that the Chinese surveillance system is any better of, 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 of Silicon Valley, it's not an either or, both are worse. Uh, so to see what is bad with it, uh, uh, let's take uh, a look at uh, the first um, short video. Right now, delivering the things people need has never been more important. To all of our Amazon retail heroes, on the floor, in the air, and behind the wheel, we want to thank you. We'll continue to do everything we can to keep you healthy, safe, and protected. The work you are doing means everything right now. Thank you. There's the only way to do that is with happy people. You can't do it with a set of miserable people, um, you know, watching the clock all day. I think this one is a very important question. What does day two look like? <laughs> what does day two look like? Um, I know the answer to this. Day two is stasis followed by irrelevance, <laughs> followed by excruciating, painful decline, followed by death. <laughs> and that is why it is always day one. Thank you, you guys. Amazon.com is my favorite toy store. Hey, you're not the boss of me. The greatest selection of toys online. I know you are, but what am I? Amazon.com, Amazon.com makes me feel like a kid, makes me feel like a kid. Stop copying me, stop copying me. So if you need some So it's always day one at Amazon. 
there is never a day two at Amazon, as you have seen. What does that mean? Uh, I think this is, uh, you know, instead of uh, me talking or deconstructing the mythologies of Silicon Valley and global capitalism, I think sometimes it's uh, just enough to watch uh, the archive footage. Uh, so for preparing this, uh, uh, these talks, uh, I usually spend a few days just browsing through different archives. And what's amazing is that when you just watch these images, uh, uh, it says everything. It shows everything what is wrong with today's system. Uh, isn't this uh, uh, what Jeff Bezos says that, you know, the day two is stasis, which is leading to, 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 to irrelevance and finally to death, uh, uh, the, 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 the basic Silicon Valley ideology and the ideology behind the, the motor of global capitalism. Uh, because for capital, ca capitalism, it's always capitalism, capitalism, sorry, my, my Balkan English, uh, it's always day one. Uh, they don't think about the day two, except about their own asses and how they could get their ass safely on a mega yacht or on a private island. Uh, what they think about is day one, accumulation of profit, accumulation of profit, accumulation of, of profit. Uh, uh, so the day two for them is out of imagination. Uh, of course, Elon Musk, uh, uh, Bezos, Bill Gates, and so on, uh, they all dream about, uh, uh, with some differences between them, uh, about the colonization of space, about the so-called so -called, uh, singularity, uh, transhumanism, and so on. Uh, so that might, uh, uh, it might look as if this uh, uh, indicates the fact that they think about a faraway future, uh, but that's not the case. Uh, what they think about in the same way as Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, Bolsonaro, all our popular, not our, not mine, definitely, uh, populists, uh, uh, populist and authoritarian leaders, uh, they are constrained in the ideology and economy of short-termism. So instead of long-termism, a long-term perspective, how will our planet look like in, in, in 100 years and what will be the working conditions, uh, what they think about is day one, day one, which is a kind of uh, eternal present. Uh, speaking of Amazon, you can see, uh, uh, you can see this uh, in the very name. Uh, so what is the Amazon the name of, uh, to put it uh, in Baduian uh, terms? Uh, uh, what is the Amazon the name of? The Amazon is the name of uh, uh, global capitalism, obviously. But what is interesting, it's again to come back a bit, although this, uh, uh, this talk today won't be so much focused on semiotics, uh, but to come back a bit uh, uh, to semiotics, if you remember or you watched or you can rewatch later uh, a previous episode, uh, I was mentioning the, the, the curious fact how the, the, the meaning uh, or the word or the signifier bikini uh, was used. You know, usually bikini is the, you know, two part swimsuit, which became famous uh, in the 50s and then later with Greta Garbo and so on. Uh, but it was named uh, uh, by a French engineer inspired by the nuclear tests at the Bikini Atoll in the midst of the Pacific Ocean. He thought that this, uh, this word is atomic and that precisely because of this atomic signified, uh, uh, the signifier would have a power uh, uh, and it actually had. Because today when you hear bikini, you don't think about uh, radioactivity, you think about summer and the beach. And some similar operation happened uh, on the level uh, of signs in the semiosphere uh, uh, with the, the signifier Amazon. Uh, you know, just go to Google or DuckDuck, <laughs> not to promote uh, another Silicon Valley company, but that's something we will discuss as well. You are watching this on YouTube, you're writing on YouTube, uh, uh, we are using Zoom. Uh, this is a big question which we have to discuss, uh, you know, how to treat these companies and products and whether it's possible to subvert them. Uh, uh, but uh, to come back to the signifier Amazon, uh, isn't it interesting uh, that uh, uh, there is and was uh, uh, a signifier also under the name Amazon. And it's of course the rainforest. But if you would go to Google or DuckDuck uh, or any search engine now and just Google Amazon, uh, the first uh, results would be the company Amazon. 
Or if you would ask someone who is not from Latin America, but Europe or other parts of the world, uh, 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 what is your first association when you hear the word Amazon? Uh, most likely the sig signified would be uh, the company, you know, this is the company which brings me books, CDs, and no one actually uses CDs anymore, but other uh, products uh, uh, to my door. You know, that's the first association. And it shows again the old Humpty Dumpty lesson uh, that uh, words can have different meanings, but in the end, it depends on the master uh, uh, who will decide what a word, word would mean. Uh, so I suggest that we look uh, at it how actually in the beginning Amazon was created. You know, how did we come? to this stage today uh, that one of the biggest winners of uh, uh, our contemporary deep crisis, which is leading to a deep uh, uh, depression, which is leading to hundreds of millions of people unemployed, to hundreds of millions of people starving. Uh, uh, let's look uh, how did a company called Amazon generate and accumulate so much profit and power. Hi there, who are you? I'm Jeff Bezos. And what, are you, what is your claim to fame? <laughs> I'm the founder of Amazon.com. Where did you get an idea for Amazon.com? Well, three years ago, I was in New York City working for a quantitative hedge fund when I came across the startling statistic that web usage was growing at 2,300% a year. So I decided I would try and find a business plan that made sense in the context of that growth. And I picked books as the first best product to sell online, which making a list of like 20 different products that you might be able to sell. And books were great as the first best because books are incredibly unusual in one respect. And that is that there are more items in the book category than there are items in any other category by far. Music is number two. There are about 200,000 active music CDs at any given time. But in the book space, there are more than 3 million different books worldwide active and in print at any given time across all languages. More than 1.5 million in English alone. So when you have that many items, you literally build a store online that couldn't exist any other way. And that's important right now because the web is still an infant technology. Basically right now, if you can do things using a more traditional method, you probably should do them using the more traditional method. In song. No, 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 no. I, the, I don't go in for carpe diem. I go in for regret minimization framework. <laughs> Absolutely. When Bezos left that Wall Street job in 1994, he followed that old American edict, go west, young man. He and his wife didn't know where they were going. In fact, the movers packed their things and were already on the road when Bezos phoned them to say he had decided on Seattle. His other big decision? Books. Sell books. Not in stores, but over the internet. The company took off like a rocket. Did you read the Times this morning, New York Times? Yeah, I saw, I saw the Times this morning. At one point on Friday, Amazon.com's total stock market value surged past $30 billion, making it worth more than a major industrial company like Texaco. That didn't blow your mind when you read it? Well, I think if you're asking for sort of an emotional response, I think it's, it's, it's very humbling and it creates a sense of responsibility. According to my calculations, you yourself are worth somewhere in the vicinity of nine or ten billion dollars today. I only say that because I've got a follow-up question. Okay. What's with the Honda? <laughs> this is a perfectly good car. <laughs> In July of 1995, from this modest ranch house outside Seattle, Bezos sold his first book. Today, he has five huge warehouses in the United States and Europe, packed not only with books, but with CDs and movies. Last year, Amazon sold more than $600 million worth of merchandise over the Internet. Books are great, no? Yes, we all read books, uh, uh, but uh, from the perspective of Jeff Bezos, uh, why are books great? Uh, books are great because uh, uh, they are items, and the more items you have, uh, so it doesn't matter what, whether it's a book or something else, it's just a statistical uh, uh, fact. Uh, if you have more items, uh, uh, your business model can be more successful. Uh, 
there is one mistake in the video which you have just seen because I've been editing, uh, well, if you can call this editing, but I'm having fun, obviously, uh, um, inspired, you know, by, by the kind of movies or editing the situ situationist uh, uh, did, uh, uh, or even uh, of some uh, Yugoslav cinema, you know, this understanding of montage uh, as uh, something which is as important as the content. Uh, uh, well, that's almost sounds, sounds like Bezos who doesn't care about the content, but just about selling items. Uh, but there is one mistake in this little video, and the mistake is a few billion dollars. <laughs> uh, why? Because I've been doing this video based on the previous figures, but then today in an article I've read, I realized that uh, uh, it's not uh, $139 billion, uh, uh, but it's actually due to the COVID-19 crisis uh, today, uh, Jeff Bezos is worth uh, $145 uh, billion. Uh, and now I'm just looking at the watch. In the last half an hour, Amazon earned $15 million. Uh, and it will earn another $15 million until the end of this show, uh, while the workers uh, today are protesting all across the United States. Uh, what is interesting uh, in watching these old videos of the Silicon Valley uh, gurus, uh, of the Silicon Valley prophets, uh, 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 at least from their own perspective, uh, is that while you watch it, you can see uh, the ideology behind it and you can see how their, how their business models actually came to birth. Uh, so here in the case of, of Bezos, but uh, it's a similar case with Steve Jobs, uh, with Elon Musk, uh, with Bill Gates, uh, uh, you can see that uh, it is precisely technology and the era of the internet uh, of the 90s, which propelled them uh, uh, to, uh, to the uh, level of, of, of wealth uh, and power where they are today. In the case of Jeff Bezos, uh, it is uh, items, doesn't matter what kind of items, it appeared that the books, uh, because there are so many books, uh, were the perfect item actually uh, uh, to send around to the people. In the case of Elon Musk, it, is, uh, it was of course PayPal, uh, but uh, it is transport. And many Silicon Valley companies actually think this is the future uh, uh, of uh, most of the, and it's already happening this future. Uh, did you see how most of the Silicon Valley companies are developing some sort of transport, because what they realized is that with such a big population rise, uh, uh, you almost 9 billion and 10 and so on, uh, uh, there is a necessity for transport. Of course, this was slowed down by the COVID-19 crisis, but you could have seen it that uh, uh, what Amazon is doing is a sort of transport. What Elon Musk is doing is also a sort of transport more directly in the sense of uh, inventing electric cars, uh, sending a car to space uh, and uh, SpaceX. Uh, so uh, here we come, I think, to, to one of the important mythologies of Silicon Valley, which I think needs to be deconstructed. Uh, this is the mythology of the super genius. Uh, you know, you remember when Steve Jobs died, uh, uh, all the newspapers were writing about Steve Jobs as the genius who invented Apple, to whom humanity will have to stay uh, 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 thankful until the end of the world. And something similar is happening uh, with uh, most of the Silicon Valley uh, 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 venture capitalists. You know, they are perceived or they even represent themselves as a sort of genius. Uh, uh, and here we come to, 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 to we will come very soon to the point of, of general intellect, uh, uh, but uh, here we also come to Tesla and to, 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 to the very name of Tesla, for instance. Uh, it's again similar to Amazon, you know, you, you have a signifier which uh, is actually a surname uh, of one of the biggest inventors of the 20th century, uh, a, a person uh, who almost as if he came from the future, uh, um, who was living in the Balkans, uh, at that time Austro-Hungarian monarchy, I don't want to go here in this eternal stupid debate whether he was Croatian or Serbian. Uh, uh, he was human and uh, uh, he, he's someone who be belonged uh, to humanity or actually to the future of humanity. And what you have is that a venture capitalist Elon Musk uh, 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 privatizes the name of Tesla, although he actually doesn't like Tesla at all. Uh, his role model is Edison. 
uh, why is this important? It's important because uh, precisely out of the relationship between Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison, uh, you can see uh, how this ideology of global capitalism actually already penetrated the globe 100 years ago. And this ideology is that, uh, you know, there is uh, uh, knowledge or what Karl Marx would call the general intellect, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, even in the case of an inventor such as uh, Nikola Tesla, uh, an accumulation of previous knowledge. You know, there is no genius uh, uh, without the knowledge of the previous scientists, courageous people, social changes, social movements, uh, without the evolution of humanity as such, there is no singular individual genius. And that's also the case for, for Nikola Tesla, whom I would call a, a genius, uh, but I'm tempted to not to do it because I think it's a very ideologically loaded term. And whom do you have on the other side? On the other side, you have Edison, uh, who is the typical example of a CEO, uh, uh, the typical example of a manager uh, who sucks out, in the same way capitalism does, is as a vampire, all the value which is created uh, uh, by, uh, by, by, by the inventors, by the working class, by people such as Nikola Tesla, who wasn't rich. Uh, uh, and then what they do, they privatize it. They put a pay, pay, patent, patent, or however you call it in, in good English, uh, uh, on it, and they privatize it and they sell it. And that's the same what Elon Musk has done with Tesla. He basically uh, robbed Nikola Tesla of his own surname. Uh, of course, you could have seen it with, with cars as well. There is a Picasso car and so on. Uh, and I think it's awful. Uh, so uh, before continuing, let's watch the next video to remind ourselves uh, how Elon Musk came to the power he has today. Hi, Elon Musk speaking. It's 7 o'clock in the morning, and Elon Musk anxiously waits for his golden payoff, his prize for paying his dues in the valley. I expect to receive uh, a car that I've just bought, which is called the McLaren F1. It's a million dollars for a car. It's, it's, uh, it's decadent. There are 62 McLarens in the world, and I will own one of them. Back in 95, there weren't very many people on the Internet, um, and certainly nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad. Not this South African entrepreneur. Musk sold his first computer program at the age of 12, and he hasn't stopped selling since. Wow, I can't believe it's actually here. It's pretty wild. Valley, it really is. There is John in the fastest car in the world. I could go and buy one of the islands in the Bahamas uh, and turn it into my you know, personal fiefdom. Wow. I'm much more interested in trying to uh, build and create a new company. So this is an ATM. What we're going to do is transform the traditional banking industry back into the new game. No, I'd, I'd say the real payoff is the sense of satisfaction having created the company that I sold. Yes, 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 but the cars. But the car sure is. The cars. Sure is Let's fun. be honest. <laughs> Sure is right now in space, that's Elon Musk's own Tesla convertible in orbit. The driver is a mannequin he's calling Starman. Oh, you'll be shocked when I spit and start static. I'll whip your style and add it to my long list of past. While you were busy digging ditches and burning bridges, I'm pumping out and veggie sacking riches. So go back to your pigeons. You're a geek. Blink by OCD. You never had sex, but you sure got screwed by me. I crush you, Tesla. There's just no putting it gently. I don't alternate my flow. I diss you. As far as role models, um, I think, you know, it's obviously some of the, the obvious role models. I think Edison was certainly a role model. Um, probably one of the biggest role models. Um, Did you study him <coughs> in life? Or? Yeah, I read books about him, absolutely. Um, and, um, and it's an interesting contrast, like Edison versus Tesla, because interesting, you know, the, the car company is called Tesla. Um, and the reason it's called Tesla is because we use an AC induction motor, which is an architecture that Tesla developed. Um, and the guy probably deserves a little more play than he gets in current society. Um, but on balance, I'm a bigger fan of Edison than Tesla, um, because Edison brought his stuff to market and made those inventions accessible to the world, whereas Tesla did, didn't really do that. Right. Um, so uh, that's, so he'd, he'd certainly be a big one. Um, Fool, you think that you can touch me with this? You couldn't handle my gifts with your greedy little mind. What's inside mine was ahead of its own time. You did not steal from me, you stole me from mankind. 
It's a wireless transmission of truth And it's a shocking real story of a banker with you And if the people knew you stopped me from making power free They would curse the Con Edison with every utility One of uh, Elon Musk's uh, biggest role models, as you could have seen, uh, is uh, Edison. I mean, as I said already before, uh, and as I said, it's uh, the best to watch archive footage. Uh, uh, I don't need to explain anything. They themselves uh, uh, say it already. So what you can see here is uh, that from an early age, uh, Elon Musk, uh, and I don't care, I don't have anything against Elon Musk, uh, personally, uh, I'm just analyzing it. Uh, as it's not about the persons, it's about the system. Uh, but it's interesting to see that Elon Musk from a very young age uh, was obsessed by cars. Yes, by expensive cars, by rare cars, by cars. Uh, 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 and uh, if uh, this shows actually how he also went from that car to, to Tesla, to the space, uh, which wasn't so much about the space, it was uh, 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 an advertisement in space, an ad, a commercial for Tesla in space. And that's also how Silicon Valley operates very often. Uh, you basically have a signifier first, uh, and then later you attribute or you empower the signifier, you know, the, 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 the let's say, T-E-S-L-A, a signifier, which doesn't mean, which is not connected to the signified Nikola Tesla anymore, the person, the inventor, uh, but it is now becoming something else. And when you send a car into space, it is obviously a commercial for the car. Uh, I mean, we could go deeper into, into uh, uh, the business model of Tesla, which would be very interesting to show. Uh, but for now, it's enough to say that uh, those who present themselves uh, as a genius today, like Tesla, Jobs, uh, uh, or Jeff Bezos uh, are nothing but a consequence of uh, not so much of having a brilliant idea. Uh, uh, you know, to, to 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 sell books is not per se a brilliant idea. Although it was uh, a brilliant idea to to think of books not in terms of content but just of uh, in terms of items. Uh, but what you have what, what you have with many Silicon Valley companies is that they wouldn't be so powerful, so rich today if there wasn't massive state investment. Uh, here the book by Mariana Mazzucato, The Entrepreneurial State, uh, uh, is relevant and useful to see how much money uh, was invested uh, uh, by the United States uh, the government uh, and its uh, institutions uh, into technology. I mean, the internet itself wouldn't be created without massive state funding, uh, but what is happening now uh, between NASA and SpaceX is something similar, you know. So it's not just that the private capitalist had a brilliant idea and then suddenly out of this idea uh, 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 they, they, they came to space. No, very often uh, 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 their own success uh, is uh, not, uh, uh, not possible to di differentiate uh, 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 from uh, massive state investment. Uh, why is Edison uh, Elon Musk's um, inspiration role model uh, well he says it because unlike tesla elon musk succeeded to bring the product uh, to to the market and to make it accessible well what elon musk doesn't say is that uh, the original plan of nikola tesla uh, was to bring for instance free electricity uh, uh, the wireless uh, uh, energy uh, to bring it to the people, not to the market, but to bring it to the people and Tesla wanted these inventions to be free. But then you have someone like Edison or someone like Elon Musk coming, privatizing something what should be owned by everyone, something what should be, I, I would call it uh, the planetary commons. Uh, you know, technology, not just nature, uh, uh, not just uh, 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 resources, uh, but also technology, the internet, should be a common good of humanity itself. Uh, so energy should be a common good, water should be a common good. Uh, all these things which are now in hands of a few big companies uh, should be a common good. Uh, so when, when, I, when I think about uh, 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 the plans of the occupation of Mars, and it's very interesting that when this project was started a few years ago, 
uh, I remember I visited, that was the first time I visited Silicon Valley, and I saw people with T-shirts, which were very famous, even people from Google uh, uh, were wearing these T-shirts, Occupy Mars. And it came a few, a few years later after Occupy Wall Street. And it's interesting how uh, 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 different these two occupations are. Uh, because with Occupy Wall Street, what you had is, of course, the uh, symbolic occupation of the financial beast of contemporary global capitalism. Uh, in the case of occupying Mars, you explicitly say that the humans uh, are colonizers uh, uh, who are coming to occupy a planet. Uh, um, and the problem, of course, is that this ideology says that you have to reach Mars in order to save uh, 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 the humans who are facing extinction. Uh, uh, but I would immediately say, of course, uh, we have to. It would be great that uh, humanity came uh, to, to such an evolutionary level that uh, uh, it would turn into a sort of uh, utopian Star Trek uh, and uh, go to space where no man or woman uh, has been before. Uh, but in the case of uh, SpaceX and Elon Musk, uh, it is again uh, a privatization of something which should be a common good. Uh, you know, just pose yourself the question whether you want uh, a guy uh, who was for the last 30 years obsessed with cars uh, to govern a new community on Mars. Uh, uh, you know, when, when I think about it, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, of course, is also someone who is heavily investing into, into space travel now. Uh, imagine these people uh, 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 governing any kind of society on any kind of planet. <laughs> uh, uh, just look at what, uh, what they are doing on the planet Earth, and you can imagine what they would be doing on on. on on Mars. Uh, so to see how this kind of future might look like, uh, which is truly a dystopia, uh, once the planet of Earth is completely destroyed and we reach the, the, the point of no return, namely extinction, uh, there will be expansion, at least in their ideology and, and dreams, uh, to the space. Uh, but uh, how do I see it? Well, let's take a look how it will look like. You probably, uh, you probably remember this movie. Uh, it's interesting that it was um, in cinemas uh, in the year 2008, uh, namely the year just during the financial crash, uh, imagining uh, uh, a future uh, where the planet of Earth becomes uninhabitable because of too much garbage and because of, uh, of course, uh, global capitalism and consumerism. Uh, so the world's population is evacuated to space, and what you can find in space are these images of people uh, who are just sitting around, uh, eating, consuming, buying, eating, sleeping, consuming, buying, eating, sleeping, consuming, buying, eating, sleeping, consuming, buying, eating, sleeping, consuming. Uh, and uh, this is the dream of Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, uh, once 
they occupy Mars, they will make sure to build a very similar society to the society today. Uh, uh, of course, unless if they have some other ideas, uh, but uh, I think Wally, uh, even if it's uh, science fiction, uh, uh, shows accurately what might, uh, what might happen. Uh, so, to come back to, to May 1st, uh, why is this day so important? Uh, it is important not because it's a holiday, uh, but because of its, its history, because of its legacy, because of the work, working class movement uh, that uh, uh, even today, and perhaps more than ever today, when you just look at the numbers uh, and the working conditions, uh, are fighting again uh, for a different future than the future which is uh, uh, dreamt, uh, uh, which is imagined by Jeff Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, or the movie Wally. Uh, so, what you have in contemporary capitalism, and you could have seen it with uh, the COVID-19 crisis, is that the system always discriminates. Uh, the system is based, the current world global uh, uh, system, uh, world capitalism, is based on discrimination. It is on the one hand based on expansion, uh, expansion in the sense, uh, you can go back to colonialism, imperialism, expansion in the sense of uh, 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 occupying territories. Uh, be first it was, uh, you know, in all old ancient times when the Greeks were colonizing uh, uh, the Ionian Islands and then later also the Adriatic Islands, uh, it was first an occupation of the sea and the islands and then also the territories around. Uh, then uh, during uh, uh, the colonial times, uh, it was also then the ocean itself uh, had a status similar to the status which space has today, but then gradually it became privatized. And the same happened with the airspace, you know. Uh, uh, the airspace, you could have seen it again uh, with the COVID-19 crisis with the so-called ghost flights, uh, also showed that, uh, you know, these empty flights which were still uh, running in order not to lose the, the, the paths and the tracks they had in the air. Uh, so basically also not only the oceans, uh, uh, but also the air, uh, is privatized uh, uh, by big airline companies, which are now again being bailed out in the same way all oil companies are being bailed out and those who actually created the current uh, crisis or what is called Anthropocene or Capitalocene, those are being bailed out, bailed out again. Uh, but besides this kind of expansion, you know, to other territories, uh, 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 you also have uh, internal Explo expansion and internal exploitation. So on the one hand, you have uh, different uh, state systems uh, or imperial powers occupying other countries uh, from the past uh, to the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, not to mention uh, the colonial uh, history in Africa and many other countries. Uh, but you also have a sort of expansion uh, uh, to the semiosphere, expansion of, uh, you know, what you're watching now, what I'm watching now, I'm watching the screen, you are watching the screen. Uh, 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 this is mediated uh, through technology, uh, which is in private hands. Uh, so this is an expansion into your room now, into my room now, uh, of companies which are making a profit out of it. Uh, so I want to go back a bit in history, uh, to, to, to another sort of, uh, I would say, exploitation and expansion, uh, which in economic, the, in, in economic theory is called uneven development. Uh, so uh, on the one hand, of course, you have the internal exploitation in one society, uh, uh, one national state and the working class is being exploited by the national bourgeoisie, uh, but you also have something uh, what in economic theory is called uneven development, uh, which basically means that some countries are developing faster uh, uh, and better, uh, uh, I mean, there is nothing better in it, uh, uh, on the shoulders of other countries. And if there was one example of it, which I want to show on the 1st of May, uh, it comes from uh, uh, Yugoslavia, from socialist Yugoslavia, uh, now ex-Yugoslavia, uh, and uh, a sort of uh, inequality which uh, existed uh, in Europe at that time already. And this is, of course, uh, uh, the working class uh, which uh, in Yugoslavia and Austria, Germany, the German-speaking uh, uh, world, uh, the working class which was named Gastarbeiter. 
uh, Gastarbeiter uh, in the sense of, which means guest workers. Uh, and you know, of course, today, now with the COVID-19 crisis, you could have seen how uh, uh, the center of the European Union, you know, there is a center uh, represented by Germany, France, and perhaps a few more countries, and there is a periphery. It was called the pigs, uh, pigs, of course, they, they, they took this pejorative meaning, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Spain, Greece, uh, did they forget something? No, but I think that the very term uh, for, forgot many other countries like Croatia, for instance, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, countries of South, Southern and Eastern Europe uh, from where the working class is actually coming. And this is not something new. That's why we will uh, show uh, a short clip uh, from a movie by Krsto Papic, uh, a Croatian uh, uh, movie director who is unfortunately dead. Uh, and he was... Uh, one of the rare Croatian directors who was maybe the, the only one, but we can discuss it with film experts, uh, who was part of the Yugoslav Black Wave. Uh, so what you will see now is uh, uh, an, uh, a clip uh, from his uh, movie uh, called Special Nivlakovi, uh, uh, Special Trains uh, from 1972. Also ich bin äh, leitend, leitender Arzt der deutschen Delegation und gleichzeitig Vertreter des Direktors der deutschen Delegation mit Sitz in Belgrad. Ich überprüfe zurzeit die Anwerbegruppe, die in Zagreb heute tätig ist. Im Allgemeinen sagt man, dass die jugoslawischen Arbeiter sehr schnell sich anpassen und man ist im Allgemeinen mit den Jugoslawen am, äh, zufrieden. Das geht auch daraus hervor, dass innerhalb der drei Jahre Jugoslawien an die Spitze der aller anderen Anwerbeländer in Deutschland gegangen ist. Und eben weil man mit ihrer Qualität sehr zufrieden ist, deshalb liegt der Schwerpunkt der Anwerbung jetzt gerade in Jugoslawien. What can I say about this, but uh, Danke Deutschland. Uh, thanks for uh, greeting all the Yugoslav workers. Thanks for having all the Romanian workers. Thanks for having all the Bulgarian workers. Thanks for having all the Serbian workers. Danke Deutschland. Uh, because without these workers, uh, your own progress uh, wouldn't be at this stage at which it is. At which it, it, oh my God, I mixed it up. Uh, uh, at the stage at which, which it is. Uh, uh, today. Um, I'm a bit uh, pissed off because uh, when I see these images, of course, they, they make me sad. Uh, they make me sad because so many people uh, from Yugoslavia uh, or ex-Yugoslavia, contemporary Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, but also other Eastern, Southern European countries have a very similar experience. And so what you can see here is that there was a process going on and it actually never stopped, not to mention Turkey uh, uh, and the Turkish migration working force uh, uh, in Germany. This process never stopped. 
it takes place for the last 50 years. And it's not just uh, uh, workers from Yugoslavia going to Germany, it is the Algerians going to work uh, to France uh, to help them to build the glorious years, the decade of progress uh, uh, in France. And it also brings us back again to Elon Musk, Elon Musk uh, uh, who uh, recently said that we have to free America. You know, that we have to free America in order to open the space for, for what? For progress. You know, this idea, this ideology of capitalism that human history is something which is developing in a kind of chronological linear way towards something more meaningful, whether that's uh, the end of history, transhumanism, singularity or something else, there is always something at the end of the tunnel. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it is always presented as paradise, you know, the end of history, liberal democracy will win and so on. Uh, but this is not the case. Uh, what the COVID-19 crisis showed is that we are not far away uh, from this uh, uh, documentary movie uh, by Krzysztof Papic, uh, Special Trains. Uh, in fact, two or three days ago, I was reading, uh, or one week ago, time gets mixed up in, 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 in isolation and COVID-19 uh, times. I read an article in the Austrian Standard uh, with the headline, Special Trains, from Romania to, to, to Austria, special trains, the same title as the documentary movie, uh, which you just show. And it is about uh, special trains, uh, 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 which would now travel, you know, the, 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 the transport currently, if someone is watching this in the future and will uh, uh, wonder why the workers couldn't move so freely. Well, it was because uh, uh, at this point, uh, uh, May 1, 2020, uh, most of the borders are closed, uh, only products are moving. I mean, that's another revelation about global capitalism. Uh, uh, no freedom of movement, uh, but freedom of move, no freedom of movement for people, uh, but freedom of movement for, uh, uh, for products, uh, for the circulation of capital. Uh, there is always freedom of movement for the circulation of capital but when it comes to refugees, when it comes to, to ordinary people, uh, 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 that's a problem. And we are heading towards a world uh, 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 opened with the COVID-19 crisis where we, will even, where we will have even more uh, restriction of, of movement, as we already have in many countries today. Uh, so uh, what you could have, what, what we have seen with the phenomenon of gastarbeiter, uh, uh, it is that it's not something which belongs to the past. Uh, so what Austria is now negotiating with Romania uh, is uh, that uh, special trains, special trains uh, 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 would take 12 hours, I think, from Romania to Austria and bring the care workers to Austria. Namely, at this moment uh, 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 and in the, in the last uh, years, Austria was depending on 70,000 care workers, you know, those people who come from uh, the periphery of the European Union, the poorer countries, the less developed, the uneven developed countries, uh, uh, and uh, uh, take care of the elders, take, take care of the sick. Uh, uh, and uh, now what's happening is that uh, due to coronavirus, they are missing the working force. And what you can see, even if people like us and so on cannot move yet, uh, capital is moving and what is moving is the working force. Uh, why is it moving? Uh, because the system doesn't care about their health. The system doesn't care about the health of workers from Romania, uh, from Croatia, uh, 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 of the gastarbeiter in the same way uh, uh, Amazon doesn't really care about uh, the working conditions uh, in its uh, warehouses. Uh, or Elon Musk doesn't care, he doesn't care about his workers because he just cares about something what is called progress. Uh, or another news, I mean, Germany is a good example. Do I thank Deutschland again for asparagus? Uh, but uh, there would be no asparagus without the working class coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. Did you know that uh, uh, yearly there is 300,000 seasonal workers in Germany uh, picking up strawberries, picking up asparagus, the most famous uh, uh, dish in Germany, whether it's white or green, in all kinds of sorts, you can always find asparagus. Uh, but asparagus is directly dependent, as many other products, on exploitation of the working class. So what is now the problem is that they don't have enough workers, so now they're organizing, they were already chartered flights to Germany, but they were also the same as in big companies in the United States, cases of people who died. Uh, uh, there was one worker from Romania who died of coronavirus uh, uh, and his job was to pick up uh, uh, asparagus and, and vegetables uh, in the fields. And now those people just imagine 
when they come to a country such as Austria or Germany, they have to go into self-isolation for 14 days. Of course, they don't have the conditions for self-isolation because they are living in apartments together with other people and so on. And when they come back to their countries, they, they have to go back to self-isolation uh, in order to, to earn a few uh, thousand euros. Uh, so again, uh, what you have on the one hand is the expansion and exploitation of other countries, but you have a class struggle happening inside of our societies. Uh, 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 another example comes uh, uh, from today's news. It's interesting, it comes uh, precisely from May 1st. Uh, it comes from India. Uh, so in India, uh, uh, the first special train for migrant workers uh, was launched today by Indian Railways and it was uh, transporting 1,200 uh, uh, migrant workers from one place in India to the other place uh, because at the moment uh, there are around 10 million, 10 million people uh, uh, in, in, in India, 10, 10 million migrants who are stranded uh, uh, due to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, so, Speaking about 1st of May, I think we cannot forget the gastarbeiter, we cannot forget the seasonal workers, we cannot forget the frontline workers, we cannot forget the exploitation, expansion and class struggle which is uh, uh, taking place even today. So speaking about class struggle, I think now is finally the moment to remember uh, and to remind ourselves of what this term really means and where does it come from. Enjoy. Die Geschichte einer bisherigen Gesellschaft ist die Geschichte von Klassenkämpfen. Die Gesellschaft spaltet sich immer mehr in zwei feindliche Lager, in zwei große, einander diametral entgegengesetzte Klassen. Die Bourgeoisie und das Proletariat. Die Bourgeoisie hat die persönliche Würde, in einem einfachen Tauschwert aufgelöst und anstelle zahlloser verbriefter und wohlerworbener Freiheiten hat sie die einzig und mitleidslose Freiheit des Handels und des Profits gesetzt. Sie hat dem Familienverhältnis seinen rührend sentimentalen Schleier abgerissen und es auf ein reines Geldverhältnis zurückgeführt. Sie hat die heiligen Schauer der frommen Schwärmerei, der spießbürgerlichen Wehmut in dem eiskalten Wasser egoistischer Berechnung ertränkt. Die Handelskrisen stellen in ihrer periodischen Wiederkehr immer mehr die Existenz der ganzen bürgerlichen Gesellschaft in Frage. Das Bedürfnis nach einem stets ausgedehnteren Absatz für ihre Produkte jagt sie über die Erdkugel. Es entwickelt sich eine Bourgeoisie des allgemeinen Handels und so eine allseitige Abhängigkeit der Nationen voneinander. Die moderne Bourgeoisie ähnelt einem Zauberer, der die teuflischen Kräfte, die er heraufbeschworen hat, nicht mehr unter Kontrolle bringt. Die Waffen, womit die Bourgeoisie den Feudalismus zu Boden geschlagen hat, richten sich jetzt gegen die Bourgeoisie selbst. Bourgeoisie is like a modern magician who doesn't have its own inventions under, under control anymore. Uh, isn't that a beautiful description of global capitalism uh, uh, today? Uh, a system, a world system, uh, which Feli Gattari would call integrated world capitalism, uh, which is expanding everywhere, which is expanding not just uh, in territories, but in 
kind of colonizing our minds as well, privatizing our minds, privatizing our emotions, privatizing our dreams, privatizing our unconscious. Uh, this is the system in which we are living today. Uh, uh, but uh, I would suggest, of course, to, to watch this movie by Raoul Peck, uh, uh, a filmmaker from Haiti. Uh, this is a movie about young Marx. The title is Young Marx. And the period how, how the Communist Manifesto was created. Uh, what is interesting to me, and here we make a full circle and uh, we are finishing soon, but not so soon. Uh, uh, we still have something to show and to talk about. Uh, uh, but to make a full circle, uh, besides, you know, what, what first of all, uh, what can we learn from the Communist Manifesto today? Uh, uh, many things, of course, but I think the most crucial thing today uh, uh, when you see that, for instance, the strike uh, in Amazon is now spreading not only uh, around the United States, but uh, around warehouses of, across Europe, uh, that other workers, delivery workers, frontline workers are also uniting all across the, the, the world. I think one of the most important lessons of the Communist Manifesto uh, was, of course, the importance of internationalism, uh, the importance of uh, 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 the working class to unite uh, uh, outside of their borders, outside of their national identities, uh, uh, to unite on a planetary level. Uh, and this is something what, what uh, today, uh, with the climate crisis, with the threat of, of a nuclear war or global pandemics, is more relevant than ever because what we can see is that there are no islands anymore. Uh, you cannot hide from global capitalism. Perhaps if you are rich, you can hide from a virus. But even if you are rich, you cannot hide uh, from the consequences this virus will have on the future of humanity and the planet. Uh, so I want to, step, to make a step further uh, from the Communist Manifesto and uh, come to one central point uh, of uh, later work, which was published actually only in the 20th century. And Marx was uh, writing, uh, working on it 10 years later after the Communist Manifesto was published. Uh, uh, so that means in uh, uh, 1857 slash 1858, uh, Marx was uh, working on something what is called Grundrisse. Uh, and in Grundrisse, there is a chapter uh, which was uh, explored uh, mainly by uh, Italian and French philosophers. Uh, mainly Italian, uh, uh, from uh, uh, what Paolo Virno, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato, uh, 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 Bifo, and many others. Uh, this is the term of the general intellect, uh, a term which sounds, uh, if you didn't come across of it, uh, as something highly abstract. Uh, but let's try to ex uh, to explain. So, uh, or you check it on the internet. Grundris uh, fragment on the machine. Uh, uh, it's an important pa pa passage. Uh, paragraph because uh, uh, Marx uh, uh, shows, and in, in all his work together with Engels, he shows that uh, 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 the development of the machinery, uh, the industrial revolution, uh, is creating new means of oppression of the workers. Uh, uh, but what he shows in the fragment on the machine uh, is that uh, uh, precisely this technological development also contains prospects. Uh, for a future liberation. Uh, and it is the general intellect, uh, here we make the full circle back to the beginning, uh, which is a term I think is highly important today uh, when our world uh, is governed or, or power or, or the, 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 the future of our planet is partially in the hands of uh, uh, private companies, multinational corporations, and venture capitalists. Uh, uh, so the Marx, uh, Marx explains, describes the general intellect as, he says, nature builds no machines, no trains, no railways, no electric telegraphs. Uh, uh, these things, like also this thing, YouTube, uh, uh, internet, uh, uh, that's not what Marx said, but I'm adding it, of course, uh, uh, are the organs of the human brain created by the human hand. Uh, uh, so what happens here, according to Marx, is that human knowledge itself is becoming, becoming objectified. And Tesla was an example of that, you know, how the general intellect, how the knowledge, 
uh, is privatized by a, a, a pre-modern, uh, or how to call it, not pre-modern, but uh, before Silicon Valley, by someone like Edison. <laughs> so here we come to, to the topic of cognitive capitalism, post-Fordism, uh, uh, and so on, but we don't have much time to go deeper into it. So what I want to explore at the very end uh, is, uh, of course, uh, what are the possibilities to react uh, what are the possibilities for uh, uh, for the struggle we have in front of us, the struggle which is happening for centuries, the struggle which I don't know, maybe it won't take place centuries because there won't be any centuries and there won't be any time anymore, but until there is time, in the time that remains, uh, uh, I think uh, there is a big struggle coming. And this struggle is being formed today, uh, so it's important that on the 1st of May we don't have a holiday, but actually engage in this struggle. Uh, <laughs> so if knowledge, if human knowledge, including emotions, including uh, desires, uh, is becoming more and more commodified, uh, you can see it on Instagram, for instance, uh, uh, or in the social media, how narcissism, the culture of narcissism is actually commodifying uh, uh, people, uh, <clears throat> uh, then what we have to do is to understand the general intellect, uh, to understand how we could hack it, how could we could take it back. Uh, uh, one example comes from, uh, uh, from the 20th century uh, history. Uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, a famous speech by uh, Mario Savio, uh, an American activist and a key member of the Berkeley free speech movement. And what you will see is a speech he gave in October 1964 at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, in front of 4,000 people, out of which 800 people were arrested. Uh, so let's listen to the, to the speech and we come back. We were told the following. If President Kerr actually tried to get something more liberal out of the regions in his telephone conversations, why didn't he make some public statement to that effect? And the answer we received from a well-meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? That's the answer. Well, I ask you to consider. If this is a firm, and if the Board of Regents are the Board of Directors, and if President Kerr, in fact, is the manager, then I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees, and we're the raw materials. But we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product, don't mean, don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings. <laughs> The time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part, you can't even passively take part, and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop, and you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. And we are back. Uh, so this is a speech uh, from the 60s, uh, but it's highly relevant today, uh, uh, especially on, the May, uh, on, on May 1st, uh, when so many workers all across the world uh, are trying in this very difficult moment of the COVID-19 crisis and uh, uh, the depression which is coming, uh, which is hitting us uh, uh, very soon uh, and it already is hitting many people in the world uh, uh, the fact that we have a luxury and we can eat and drink uh, doesn't mean that some other people are uh, happy as us and that they can eat and drink and take care of their children or parents uh, uh, so what savio is proposing in the speech is that uh, in the time when the machine when the operation of the machine becomes so odious uh, uh, we have to throw our bodies into the machine. Uh, we have to stop the machine of working. Uh, I think this is still correct today when it comes to physical work. Uh, I think the notion of, the, of a general strike is still very important and we can all participate, participate in it uh, because Amazon, Google, Facebook, all these big uh, uh, companies which uh, most of the people are using today uh, uh, would be nothing without us. 
they need the consumers. Uh, so if you want to stay a consumer, stay a consumer. If you want to think, uh, then also uh, think about the option of not using some of these companies uh, or boycotting uh, it at least for a day. Uh, imagine that for one day, all the consumers, all the people in the world uh, would not order stuff from Amazon. Uh, it would be a big blow to the company. Uh, but here I come to, to my last and final point. Uh, uh, it's not enough. Uh, if the term of the general intellect teaches us anything, it is that uh, you cannot just stop the machine from working. Uh, I actually think this is a very uh, naive idea, you know, that we will just either throw our bodies into the machine, prevent it from working or destroy technology. I don't think this is the solution. Uh, I think uh, 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 at the same time, as much as necessary it is uh, to enact actions of civil disobedience. Uh, uh, you've seen, for instance, what Extinction Rebellion was doing. Uh, uh, I think that's important. Uh, and it's important to come back to the anarchist leg uh, legacy of uh, Henry David Thoreau, Peter Kropotkin and others who were actually imagining a world where you come together and self-organize. Uh, but at the same time, I think what we need today more than ever is to understand the machine, uh, to understand it properly, uh, to understand how the machine can be used against the machine. Uh, so instead of just stopping the machine, uh, we have to understand uh, how can we hack the machine. And the current strike which is happening today is a good example. Uh, so even if uh, some of these platforms are owned by, by venture capitalists, uh, uh, the Amazon warehouse strikers and those working in, in FedEx, uh, Hall, uh, uh, and, and, and other companies uh, were organizing through the internet. So they were using Signal and Telegram and Zoom in order to organize. Uh, of course, just imagine what young Karl Marx would have done if he had this opportunity which we have today. Uh, what would the guerrilla movements of the 20th century do if they were happy uh, enough uh, to have the possibilities of reaching out to people in the immediate present and not writing a telegram or a letter which would arrive in one, one week. Uh, uh, of course, this internet which we use uh, is not a free internet at all, uh, uh, but there are still some cracks which we can use. Uh, uh, but instead of just subverting the system, I think what is necessary now, and you can see that many social movements, including DM25, uh, what is necessary is to propose bold, and not only propose, but to struggle tirelessly for bold, uh, uh, bold measures, uh, which would take us not into the future trend by venture capitalists, Wally, occupation of Mars, uh, or whatever it is, uh, but would actually build a better future in the current present, in the time that remains until the very end. Uh, uh, and in this sense, I think it's important to start talking about something what we in BM25 call the universal basic dividend, uh, which is a bit different from the universal basic income, uh, because it doesn't come from taxes, uh, 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 it comes from the dividends, shares in big companies, which everyone of us should be able to own. Uh, uh, it also brings us to the question of automation, uh, because all these workers uh, in warehouses, uh, uh, deliveries and so on, who are now losing their jobs, uh, in 10 or 20 years, uh, uh, if something unexpected doesn't happen, and unexpected things very often happen, and they are in inevitable in a way, uh, uh, we might face a global automation where most of these workers won't be necessary anymore. You know, the millions of truck workers, in, in, in millions of them in the United States, uh, 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 will lose their jobs uh, because of automation, if they don't lose it before because of, of the 21st century. Great Depression. Uh, the same goes for, for, for people working in supermarkets, for people uh, delivering stuff and so on. This can all be done by machines and is already being done by machines. What is the problem? The problem is the means of production. Who owns the means of production? Who owns the machines? Who owns Amazon? Who owns Google? Who owns Facebook? Uh, who owns uh, 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 those services which all of us are using today? Uh, and instead of private ownership, what we need today is commons, uh, is the general intellect. We need to free the general intellect again. Uh, but since we are a bit late, I'm sorry for this. It was a long episode and we just scratched and touched upon some of the topics which uh, are, are in my mind necessary to investigate today. Uh, we will end uh, by, I think, uh, 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 
appropriate uh, song uh, from uh, uh, ex-Yugoslavia. It is uh, originally uh, a song inspired uh, by the rebellion on the island of Hvar, uh, which happened several centuries ago when Hvar was still uh, uh, under the occupation, can I call it like that? Yes, uh, of Venice. And uh, uh, the peasants and workers of Hvar uh, uh, made a rebellion against the domestic landlords and Venice. Uh, and uh, inspired by this Hvar uh, rebellion, uh, Josip Smodlaka, who happened to be the mayor of Split later, uh, uh, in 1908 wrote a song which is called Slobodarka, uh, uh, which then later turned into a famous revolutionary song of the, of the partisans and the guerrilla fighting against uh, uh, the Nazis and, uh, and, the, and, and the nationalists, both in Serbia and, and Croatia, and the fascists. Of course, uh, uh, the song was called Padaj Silo i Nepravdo, uh, Usput Svetan Prvi Maj, da malo pričam i na našem jeziku, uh, in English translation, fall, force and injustice. Uh, happy 1st of May. Uh, if you are at home, watch some of the movies, Young Marx, or read the Grundrisse. Uh, if you are at the streets, if you are in a warehouse, uh, uh, you have my full support uh, and uh, DM25 is doing its best to help you. Uh, you can also watch an episode which was recorded today with Chris Smalls, uh, the whistleblower from Amazon, uh, who is now organizing uh, different uh, uh, frontline workers all across the world. Uh, so it's not just high theory, it is activism uh, and concrete action, subversive action, uh, which we need today. Uh, so kisses from me, enjoy, enjoy the evening and also have some fun because the revolution without fun is not a revolution I will join. Bye-bye. <laughs>